Thank you. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I'm not really delighted to, to see you here uh, for this uh, event for the Cambridge Festival, uh, where we're going to talk about this uh, collection in Cambridge University Library. Uh, so I work uh, in the in the library where I'm in charge of French collections. And uh, Sophie, who is uh, going to speak uh, with me, uh, is a PhD student uh, who is currently uh, finishing a PhD on uh, that particular collection. So uh, what is this uh, liberation collection? So you might have uh, heard uh, of it uh, already. Um, so it's a collection uh, acquired by Charles uh, Chapecrilly. Uh, who um, built a collection of books um, published between uh, the liberation of, of France, uh, so 1944 and 1946, uh, uh, books which relate, I guess, to the French experience uh, of the war. And um, it led uh, in 2014 uh, to an exhibition at the University Library of uh, some of the books uh, in the collection. Uh, but we have to say that since then, the collection has continued to grow. Um, uh, so it was, you know, a couple of hundred books initially. Now it's more than 3,000. Um, so there's been a long, you know, uh, work, uh, I guess, in progress, acquiring the books and cataloging them in the, in the library. Um, and where what we want to do, I guess, is to promote research and use of the collection. Um, so I think, um, you know, uh, people in Cambridge and academics working on World War II in the UK start to have some uh, knowledge of the collection and start using it. But it is something that we are really, uh, I guess, developing. So there was a series of uh, lectures, liberation lectures. You might have attended some of them, uh, organized uh, by Charles, uh, where we had public speakers um, talking about uh, liberation-related uh, 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 topics. And um, so, yeah, so we're also, uh, you know, trying to disseminate, I guess, um, knowledge of the, the collection through a blog posts. We have a Flickr album because a lot of books uh, in this collection are uh, illustrated. We have a Facebook group, so don't hesitate to join them uh, if you're interested. And so the latest development in, ter in terms of use of the collection, so the collection is accessible to any user of the library. Uh, so you could, you know, if you want <laughs> to carry on research to see the collection. Uh, get a reader pass and have access to the collection. Um, but so one of the latest developments uh, with the work in the collection has been this uh, PhD project where we uh, received uh, funding from the AHRC, uh, so a full funding for um, a project. And so Sophie uh, was awarded um, the, the funding uh, for work on humor uh, in the liberation. And uh, so more Recently, so we um, the cycle of um, uh, liberation lectures, I guess, has uh, ended. Uh, but now we have a new scheme, a visiting a scholar program, uh, which is starting this year, which is a three months uh, visiting fellowship for typically an academic, uh, but it can be at different stages of their career, who comes to Cambridge and to the library to do work uh, on the collection. Uh, in partnership uh, with Clairefall, and so very soon we'll be able to tell you about the recipients uh, of, uh, of this uh, of this uh, bursary, obviously. Um, so this, um, yes, yeah, so this collection um, is uh, is really interested in that it has lots of um, yes illustra uh, illustrated uh, material. Um, a surprising number of books uh, illustrated by artists, engravers, some of them relatively forgotten, um, and books which um, I guess are um, interesting in that they are the works of writers, publishers, artists who are uh, marked by uh, the experience of the war and the occupation, the deportation, Nazi uh, persecution, and the liberation. Um, and so these books are objects of a collaboration between the writer and the artist or illustrator. Um, and some of them raise the question of the compatibility between sometimes difficult war-related subjects uh, and the modes of their textual and visual uh, representation. Um, especially in the case of these boy livres, artist books are all works of art. And that's what I'm going to uh, focus uh, on today. Um, so um, literary and artistic creation uh, of course, take us beyond what is uh, strictly referential. And both the text and the illustration in these publications uh, have a part to play 
uh, when their authors, uh, from soldiers to resistance, present themselves as witnesses uh, and have an explicit documentary and or didactic purpose. And um, we can indeed question the motivations and condi conditions of production uh, of this illustrated book um, and the specific role uh, played by uh, images uh, in these works at the end of the war. And um, so I, I will talk about yeah, elements uh, characteriz uh, characterizing the creation and circulation of these uh, collaborative illustrated books uh, in their uh, historical, social, and economic context. Uh, so this involves uh, analyzing different types of uh, illustrated books published at the end of the war. Uh, so from luxury books to more modest and confidential publication. Uh, and they have also very different ideological perspectives uh, and present different types of collaborations between artists and writers. Uh, they demonstrate the resilience of people and places throughout the war, uh, raising funds for charity, commemorating uh, and honoring heroic deeds, um, such as clandestine printing, uh, or there, they can be poetical works du uh, written during these années sombres, which are printed or reprinted um, at the liberation and after the war. These publications, considered uh, globally in their materiality and often complex uh, circumstances of production, deserve to be better known uh, as they renew our understanding of the history of the book uh, and text and image relations. So to, to give you a little bit of context first, uh, so what is book production, consumption, and trade uh, of books uh, so during the world, Second World War and the occupation? So from the summer of 1940, uh, the German propaganda department published lists banning titles uh, and writers uh, hostile to uh, Germany, written by Jews, political exiles, um, etc. Um, the, the books on this list could be seized by the authorities at <laughs> bookshops or libraries and then destroyed, or they were set apart or sealed and be became uh, incommunicable. So that's typically what happened in public libraries. Um, publishing houses were arianized, um, and uh, the National Union of Publisher Publishers signed a censorship agreement in 1940. And the Vichy regime uh, itself also used censorship uh, to put books and the press at the service of their ideology of national revolution. Um, the Second World War was also marked in France by a general shortage of paper, which led to quotas and a system of distribution administered by a commission for the control of the paper intended for publication. It was created in the spring of uh, 1942. So in this context, it is really remarkable that some of the luxury books uh, that are produced and illustrated uh, at the end of the war and the liberation uh, retain characteristics such, such as generous use of white space, uh, whether in the margins or throughout uh, the abundance of blank pages. And despite uh, the scarcity of the book and the challenges uh, raised by its distribution after the armistice, with the, um, with the establishment of the border between free and occupied zone in France, the, the occupation was a period really characterized by a thirst for reading. The restriction of the control offer and the difficult circumstances may have encouraged escapism uh, through reading, but also fueled an interest in contemporary history um, related maybe to uh, a desire for intellectual reconstruction. While Christian literature encountered a certain success, erotic works were the subject of a clandestine traffic. Um, and the market, in particular uh, books by Anglo-Saxon writers, uh, whose reprinted was uh, prohibited, uh, was quite uh, flourished. French publishers uh, thus experienced a paradoxical prosperity and a significant increase in revenues despite the losses uh, related to the prohibition lists because of the demand. Books, uh, book sales uh, were uh, very good, including for luxury works uh, sold by subscription. The occupation and uh, the immediate post-war was also a time when collections of luxury works were dispersed uh, through numerous auctions uh, of important book collections. 
But in that case, the, book, the books could also become a source of profit uh, and rare books, a haven for both bibliophiles and speculators. So I'm uh, first going to talk about this example um, of a luxury anthology uh, to raise funds for prisoners of the uh, So uh, Narratives of Prisoners was published um, on the 31st of July, 1944, uh, by the Paris Press Committee, and it aimed to raise funds for the prisoners of the corporation and their family. Um, the, so this... Um, so this was uh, a frequent uh, case trying to raise funds uh, for different uh, corporations. And you can see on the cover, um, so a reproduction of a model by uh, Maurice Solo, who has Prix de Rome, a sculpture entitled On the Road to Exile, which dates uh, from June 1940 and shows three dispirited French soldiers during the debate. Uh, the anthology was published after the Normandy landing, but before the liberation of Paris, and it opens very strikingly uh, with a dedication to Marshal Pétain as evidence of the author's admiration and dedication. Um, prisoners uh, of war played an important role in the ideological and political justification of the Vichy regime um, until the very end, as you can see. <laughs> like the illustrators, most writers in the book were of collaborationist tendency, uh, especially journalists, contributing to publications such as Je suis partout or Niger. Some had already received prizes for the publication of their experience as prisoners. And um, there was a painter, but most of the illustrators were actually uh, specialized in press cartoons um, and uh, book illustration, including minor genres such as uh, children's literature or detective novels. Uh, we have illustrations either in small format inserted in the text or full page, representing scenes and characters from the different stories, often emphasizing the camaraderie and importance of entertainment uh, in the camps uh, in the, when they were imprisoned, uh, such as theatrical perform uh, performances. Um, so above you have uh, uh, the example of uh, Le Médaillon, Le Médaillon by uh, Jacques-Paul Bihan who was also author of Visa du Stalag, published in 42. Um, and it's, it's illustrated by uh, Jean Cluzo uh, Lano, a French painter, uh, who received a medal for, uh, at the Universal Exhibition in Paris in 1937. And uh, so this particular text uh, focuses on the comedy shows organized on a weekly basis for the entertainment of prisoners. Uh, it focus, uh, it foc its focus is this alienated inmate nicknamed Marshal Mungipi, um, whose name is reminiscent, of course, of the medieval heroes. Uh, but because of his uh, mental condition, acts as a theatrical character in everyday life. And he eventually stars in a performance stage uh, in a barrack in, um, in the camp. Uh, so we have a tale uh, infused with empathy uh, with a character who lost his sanity uh, as a consequence of the war uh, and the defeat. Um, so this uh, particular uh, collection is an ambitious uh, coll collaborative publication and material success as a large and thick volume of almost 200 pages uh, with previous collaborations between writers and illustrators. Uh, but um, so this, so this collaboration, coll uh, the collaboration is the leaning of the volume uh, also appears in the relatively mild nature uh, of the prisoners' accounts and the illustrations. Uh, this can be also explained by the fundraising objective. A collection with, uh, which overall provides a relatively watered-down, humorous, and at times pathetic view uh, of life in the prisoners' camp. Um, this other example uh, presents the illustrated book uh, as a sweet retrospective on occupied Paris. Um, so, En Abri, uh, 44 Paris et Respire Encore is a poem by Paul Éluard, illustrating, and the term is interesting, um, Seven Wash by Jean Hugo. It was printed on the 15th of April, uh, 45, and explicitly reverses the expected relation between text and image, making Éluard's poem an illustration of the gouache. A book which is only 20 pages long, it had a large print run, and was published by the Galerie Charpentier, founded in the 19th century. Um, 
the, the girl thing, uh, so directed by Raymond Asanta from 41, continued its activities during the war uh, with many exhibitions uh, and helped the prestigious Concert de la Pléiade, as well as auctions, uh, partic particularly uh, prized by the Germans. This gallery played a leading role in the post-war artistic revival through the publication of bibliophile uh, editions. The air of simplicity of Hugo's watercolors, accompanied by the facsimile of the Arabo manuscript, emphasized the calm and peaceful character of the city, far from the drama and trials uh, of life during the occupation. This perspective on war is characterized again by avoidance, uh, and it maybe already appeared in Hugo's production during the First World War, uh, despite his active part in the fighting at the time. Uh, the title asserts the persistence of life despite the war, offering a note of optimism. Um, the city of Paris, personified, is not out of breath, expiring, but holds on and carries uh, the hope of renewal. Um, the light, uh, optimistic colors of the painting express the spring rebirths of the eternal city, uh, while the Parisians, young and old, go about their daily activities. Um, it is only in the very last image that uh, Hugo refers to the historical content when you see white parachutes descending into this orange sky above the rooftops of Paris, soon to be liberated. Eluard's text uh, about the threat posed by the Germans who plan to blow up the bridges on the Seine to prevent the advance of the Allies. At the end of the poem, uh, reflections on the city and on mankind give way to the praise of a resurrected city where the individual is part of a community celebrating victory of the day. Um, so you have here a paradoxical rereading of the occupation period, erasing past conflicts and the thorny question of collaboration to affirm with the return of peace and freedom, a form of continuity, uh, perseverance, and hope. And indeed, uh, you also have um, uh, many books um, illustrating and celebrating, uh, as well as commemorating the liberation. Image de notre délivrance was published in December 44 by the Edition du Pavois, um, publisher in 46 of L'Univers Concentrationnaire by David Rousset. Um, a book, again clearly of a bibliophile nature, presented by the, the editor as a documentary. Uh, the result of an accidental accidental collaboration between the writer, Georges Duhamel, and the artist, Claude Le Pape, both reacting to a unique historical event to produce l'un des documents uh, les plus émouvants sur les glorieuses journées de la libération. So, one of the most uh, moving documents on the days, the glorious days of the liberation. Um, and you have a mention of uh, the fact that uh, Duhamel belonged to the Académie Française, may be intended to emphasize the role of resistance against uh, Pétainist ide ideology that the author played during the occupation in a politically uh, divided institution. And here again, the use of images in the title paradoxically encompasses both the text and the illustration. And Duhamel himself uh, describes his writing as a series of images, memorable euphoric scenes collected uh, during the historical days of August uh, 44. The text becomes album, series of portraits, moving swiftly and enthusiastically from one image to the other. And a similar jubilation appears in the short drawings uh, of Claude Le Pape, um, so painter and engraver, with the use of the national colors, blue, white, and red in his uh, um, sketches, as uh, associated with the recurrence of allied flags and highlighting the festive and humorous atmosphere of the meeting of the French, English, and American troops with the civilian population, men and women expressing excitement, joy, and a few. Um, you, you also find in the collection, um, so anthologies uh, and poetic, uh, poetic works. Here, uh, Amy Badakov son Grémoire is a collection of French uh, poetry dedicated to Paul Eluard and Georges uh, Inné, including an engraving uh, signed uh, by Oscar Dominguez, as well as two drawings. It's, um, 
the reprint of poems uh, which had been published in an anthology by Les Editions de Minuit in 24, uh, L'Honneur des Poètes, uh, and in the literary resistance journal L'Eternel Revue, both directed by Binglar. The poet may be relatively forgotten, uh, Amy Bakalov Croisier. He was born to a French mother and a Bulgarian father. Uh, he was a student during the interwar period and uh, joined uh, or was related uh, to the Surrealist movement. Um, that's probably how he actually met uh, the, uh, the artist Oscar Dominguez. Under the occupation, uh, Bakalov took the pseudonym Jean Jacquet and was involved in various resistance actions, anti-German communication, propaganda, production of fake ID cards, etc. In 43, he joined the Pavillon Noir Resistance Network as an interpreter to help fugitive Russian allies and provide strategic intelligence on the situation in Normandy. His poem in Sonne et Noir invoke departure, actions, struggle, violence, destruction, uh, and feature snapshot images uh, oscillating between objective description in the third person and uh, the use of a collective voice. The enemy uh, appears sometimes in the singular, sometimes in the plural, and it's only in the final stanza of the last poem that the I, uh, the voice uh, of the poet, uh, appears. Uh, je crois, je marche, un but désir, j'espère. So I believe uh, I'm walking um, uh, a goal, desire, I'm, I'm hoping. The, uh, the illustrations of Oscar de Minguez, uh, so were produced as a later stage uh, and do not maintain a strictly illustrated relation to uh, the text. So Dominguez was a Spanish painter who moved to Paris in the late 13th and before the Second World War contributed to several publications of Guillaume Ismado, as well as many series, books and exhibitions. His activity uh, as an illustrator and a painter continued under the occupation and after the war. And uh, he illustrated the 47th edition of Eduard's Poésie et Végique des 42, uh, published by Les Nourritures Terrestres. In uh, his drawings, uh, sorry, <laughs> in uh, dialogue with each other, um, yeah, sorry, I only put one of them. Um, the black line on the white paper creates degrees of light and darkness. Um, you have this figure of a woman uh, crying out, holding out a candle. Um, and the, the, the poems, uh, which oscillate between narrative and lyrics, unfold uh, the trauma of the war, uh, the experience of the occupation and the acts of resistance. But by contrast to you know, very specific uh, mentions in uh, the text, the illustrations uh, seem to focus on more symbolic female figures uh, giving a slightly different perspective on, um, on that account, all that poetic account. What's interesting also is that Balakov, uh, Bakalov in 45 had the opportunity to reclaim in his own uh, poetry collection what he had previously con uh, published con clandestinely. Um, and, uh, and this way he can pre present his work as a coherent single author uh, poetic collection. And the, the images, uh, so introducing these you know, female features with sharp outline, screaming or exhausted, hopeful or pacified, uh, in their confrontation with darkness and light, death and fire, uh, using symbolism uh, or allegory, are still another way of engaging with the experience of the war. Um, by contrast with the work of... Sorry, I... Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, of professional uh, organizations such as, such as the National Union of Publishers, which was compromised with the German occup uh, occupier. This volume, Ecrot Donald, so Proofs or Trials in the Shadows, uh, published in June 46, pays tribute to printers engaged in resistance action. Uh, printers owned the necessary equipment and expertise and played a decisive role in the production of clandestine publications and the manufacture of forged papers. Again, this is a publication in large formats, a literary illustrated books issued in a slipcase. 
uh, aim to provide financial assistance to the families of printers, I quote, executed by the Germans who disappeared or died in the deported camps. All pr profits from the publication will be donated to the cash register of the Groupe Parisien de l'Imprimerie Clandestine, so the Parisian group for clandestine printing. And the book is dedicated to the memory of 10 named printers, uh, their employees, and all the unknown printers who gave their lives for freedom. It's a handcrafted illustrated anthology produced uh, by several hands, a recurring aspect uh, in the bibliophile works published after the liberation. Contributors include François Mauriac, Georges Duhamel, Paul Éluard, uh, etc. It was printed by Jacques Aumont, who during the war produced uh, clandestine posters to encourage the spirit of résistance of the people of France. Uh, in 1945, he had already published La Grande Délivrance de Paris and uh, Time, Hommage à la Résistance uh, PTT. The, the book uh, includes four original engravings by Chies, Daranès, Galanis, and Gerg, whose objective is to preserve the memory of the obscure and perilous role played by clandestine printers, sometimes to their death. And the first two plays represent printers, indeed, with the attributes of their profession. Uh, including this very romantic uh, introductory uh, lithograph of uh, Demetrius Galanis. Um, Death is featured as a winged uh, cadaveric figure holding a sickle, whispering into his ears. Referring to the long standing tradition of publishing and illustrating dances of death, Galanis exposes the dangers facing printers who worked underground during the war and the occupation. Um, Jean Cassou, so curator of the Musée d'Art Moderne, this piece by the Vichy government, and editor of the clandestine newspaper Résistance, before fleeing uh, to Toulouse, uh, pays tribute to the Lyon brothers from Toulouse who had been deported um, by the guest of to Germany um, because their workshop produced leaflets, newspapers, and false papers, uh, a center of the clandestine produc uh, production of the region of uh, Toulouse. You have um, here another uh, woodcut, uh, so by Jean Chies, uh, with um, a geometric cuts showing a printer working clandestinely at mid dikes under the light of the lamp. Um, in the uh, so in uh, in a contrast of black and white, while in the deserted street uh, appears an ominous night patrol of three suspicious-looking German soldiers, helmeted and in uniform. The uh, illustration is associated with a text entitled Albert X Imprimeur by Claude Aberlin, himself a writer and resistance painter, uh, fighter, founder of the clandestine newspaper Combat. So he tells the story of the printer who began to print small pieces called papillon butterflies inscribed Vive la France Libre, Vive de Gaulle, Radio Paris Lies, Radio Paris is German, and stick them on official posters, walls, and benches. Uh, in the metro, wherever he could. Uh, so he printed a clandestine newspaper, but uh, one evening his workshop was searched by German soldiers, including an expert who recognized the press and destroyed all the printing equipment. He was uh, deported, uh, sentenced to forced labor uh, in a salt mine. And uh, while the text goes into the details of clandestine printing and unfolds the tragic uh, destinies of its actor, the engraving communicates the understated drama of the situation by exposing the meticulousness, loneliness, and dedication of the printer whose uh, activity is about uh, to be discovered. Um, and so here's an example of uh, so some other people feature in the anthology where you have the example of this secret clandestine press so in someone's apartment uh, hidden in a wardrobe and uh, how he could you know, just close, close the door and hide the, the ministerial uh, workshop. Um, so this uh, volume so features important personalities within the printer's corporation and pays tribute uh, to the professionals of the book engaged in the resistance in Paris, in the province, and in the camp, camp camps. Um, so talking about uh, the camps, so this is uh, going to be my uh, my last uh, example. Augustin Dauphier Bartholé, 
a poetic text by Guy Levis Mando, who was prisoner of war in Pomerania between 40 and 45, and wrote in captivity under the pseudonym Jean Garabon, uh, so three poems, Image de l'homme immobile. And he managed to send them uh, to Albert Vega um, without having the stamp of the camp authorities, or miraculously. Uh, and they were published uh, in, 47, uh, in 43 in the Cahier du Rhône, a resistance Swiss literary magazine. Um, and it, it turned out that the editor of this magazine was a friend uh, of uh, Levis Mano, but he hadn't recognized him, uh, but immediately you know, sensed the literary quality uh, of the piece and decided to publish it. Um, so uh, Guy Levis Mano was uh, a, a publisher, uh, so founded in 33, uh, focusing on illustrated books and surrealist authors, including Elua, as well as Andre Breton. But the workshop closed uh, in 39. And after the war, uh, GLM turned more uh, towards poetry with many translations into French and editions of uh, earlier poets. It then used all the typefaces, often a small print because of the shortage of paper. But this isn't the case for Rufin au Coeur Barbelé, uh, which again in a, is illustrated, which is quite uh, unusual in the post-war publication of uh, Guy Lévis Mano. Um, so according to uh, Coron, after the war, there was a real break in the, I guess, publishing policy uh, of uh, Guy Lévis Mano, refusing color, largely restricted books, too expensive and often unbalanced in the relation between image and text. They then preferred readability, austerity, and simplicity. And, um, and here you can see uh, I guess that we have quite uh, sorry, uh, a different example, um, and that in this particular case, uh, through uh, the drawings of Lagage, you have this evocative arrangement, both economical and efficient, of the black lines, reminiscent of the flexibility and variety of forms that the wire, the barbed wire of the, the cans, uh, can adopt, giving the human figures a slender appearance a fluid and slippery outline. Um, so, so this uh, anthology highlights the long-term impact of the experience of war and imprisonment in post-war France. With this publication, poet and publisher underline the continuity between the poetry printed and distributed clandestinely during the war and that published after the liberation. An experience uh, of war that shaped the work and the poetic language about new editorial uh, choices. choices. Um, so, these, um, so this illustrated book uh, at the liberation kind of helps to position themselves in relation to that experience of war and the occupation. And, um, and they allowed the collection of funds for various, various charitable causes. Uh, causes. Um, in narrative or poetic form, they tell the experience of men uh, confronted with themselves and others expressing the desire of writers and artists to share, shape, and justify their experience verbally uh, and visually through different modes of collaboration. The illustrated books uh, work as testimony and commemoration, the, the humiliation of defeat and the sorrows of imprisonment to the euphoria of liberation. Some reprint and illustrate texts formerly published clandestinely, um, and earlier work on previous collaboration between writers and artists, collabor collaborations which were renewed, uh, new ones uh, were forged, following meetings made during the war. Confronted with the trauma uh, of the war, individual poetic production and their illustration spearhead the exploration and experimentation of this new linguistic, uh, graphic, and visual form. Thank you. But now uh, I'm going to have Sophie, so who is uh, doing her PhD on uh, humor uh, in print uh, in the aftermath of the second world war. So a different type of illustrated talks. <laughs> so if you don't mind, we'll keep the questions till the end. Yes. So we've just had two talks and the uh, So, um, welcome everyone. And uh, very lovely to see you here. It's a real honor to um, present my research and some known faces, some not known faces. It's probably the last uh, time in my thesis that I'm presenting uh, my, my research because now I'm going to be chained to my desk to finish uh, my work until the, um, it's finally submitted. 
Um, thank you very much, Yahel. Uh, it's really interesting. I hadn't heard this talk yet. And uh, it was so nice to, to see the books that um, I obviously saw in the past because I worked with Chadwick, uh, Charles and McKinney uh, on building a collection for a long time, six, six and a half years. So I saw each and every book in this collection before starting this thesis. Um, so um, my research um, is on the early post-war period in France, obviously, since I'm, I'm, I'm working on the liberation collection from the Allied landings in June 1944 until the establishment of the False Republic at the end of October 1944, the 46th. Uh, I'm working, I'm looking at uh, this period through the lens of humorous drawings, uh, print sheet in books, and the press uh, of the time. So before embarking on my PhD, I had the work pleasure to work with Charles as a bibliographical researcher and um, while doing this fascinating work, I couldn't help uh, but notice that a large number of publications uh, contained humor, and in particular cartoons. This abundance of humor surprised me, as uh, despite the joy of the liberation, this period of transition was very challenging for the French. What could people be laughing about at the end of a terrible conflict that had seen uh, so much death and destruction? <coughs> the French were hungry, they were cold, Many had lost their homes and members of their families. There were still two million French displaced persons in Germany. The country was ideologically divided and the state in ruins. What was so funny and why was there so much humor in this publication? So my thesis considers the nature, function and limits of humor in print in the early post-war um, period in France. I'm interested in the purposes of humor, humorous drawings, the press applied um, to their publishing, and the often big topics such as the fate of the Jews. This talk aims to offer a reform view of some of the main cartoon topics of, in my caucus of about 6,000 images and some insights into what the drawings teach us of how the French experienced the transition period from war to peace. So let's look at the type of publications that contained humour. So cartoons were printed in monographs, as you can see a, 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 a selection here. Yearbooks, collections of drawings sometimes first printed in the press and then uh, in collections. Uh, comics and or bande dessinée, and drawings by prisoners of war and uh, forced laborers in Germany, gathered in souvenir books at the end of the war, like uh, we had discussed earlier as well. Or even funny coloring books of the French resistance, like the one on the bottom right. So they were sometimes pretty on beautiful, luxurious paper, uh, but more often they were published on very fragile uh, and poor quality paper um, with in very, very poor quality ink due to shortages. Uh, some of these were produced during the German occupation, but remained unpublished until after uh, the liberation for censorship reasons. The Germans or the Vichy regime uh, would not have allowed them, or because the authors were in prisoners' camps and could not print it until they were freed. Others were produced in the immediate post-war period. So my corpus also contains press titles, newspapers, satirical magazines and various weeklies representing all political ones, except extreme right publications like Je suis partout, Au Pilori or La Gerbe, which were shut down at the liberation. The journalists and cartoonists who had collaborated to this pro-German, pro vichy pro and anti-Semitic or anti allies papers are fled abroad or went, you see, <laughs> went silent, fearing the retaliations of the purge committees who condemned, at the end of the war, those who had collaborated with the Nazis. So today we'll explore some of the main topics in the early, early post-war cartoons, broadly divided into three uh, parts. So, humor by daily challenges, mocking the enemy, and uh, humor by prisoners of war. We'll look at first, humor about uh, daily life. So, one of the main topics that cartoonists drew about in the post war period was the difficult living conditions that most people had to bear. Uh, they were frequently linked with food shortages, hunger in queues, or were a recurring theme in life um, and in cartoons alike. 
So uh, where transportation issues due to the energy crisis and war damage and the shortages of the homes, again, due to destruction during the war and the battles of the liberation. So let's uh, have a look at some examples. So Jews were central to daily uh, life during the war and its immediate aftermath. They were the symbol of the um, ever present rationing of essentials. In towns, Jews were a time consuming element of many people's daily routines until early 1949, uh, often lasting hours every day. They inspired many humorous cartoons. Uh, Albert, Albert Dubou has been dubbed the master of crowns, you can see why, and Jews offered him great opportunities to express his talents. In his image printed in 1944, Dubou exaggerates the chaos and scale of the queue for comical effect. Uh, with uh, his properly dressed ladies, complete with handbags, I think you can see them running towards uh, the, uh, enthusiastically towards the fight, he breaches the viewer's expectations for conical effect. Dubu's contemporaries got a sense of belonging to the group by belonging to the almost universally shared experience of the cure. Uh, humor was often used to strengthen group identity as well as for catharsis. So in the caption, Que de Moru, Castel, I don't know if you can see, is it big enough? Uh, Dubu uses a pun uh, referring to uh, Q or Q, as in waiting in line, or Q as in tail, as Q can mean both in French. Um, note that the caption was also in English, as Dubu uh, enjoyed international success at the time. So let's have a look at uh, transportation issues. So here, Raoul Guérin um, targets the transport and fuel crisis uh, caused by the war. A man offers an elegant woman a lift home in a wheelbarrow. He looks and she looks unimpressed. <laughs> An art of the drawings about daily struggles joked about the substitute or as acts that the French had to resort to, like uh, chicory for coffee and saccharin for sugar. Again, illustrates the proliferation of Erzat, the taxi, a phrase that was used for the first time in 1940, 1940 during the German occupation and had become commonplace by the end of the war. Still, the man's surprised look shows that using wheelbarrows to cross Paris was not completely normalized yet. Sure. A word on the artist to understand how the context influenced, influenced what was printed. So Gehan was a well-known cartoonist before the war. Uh, because of his contributions to collaboration papers during the occupation, the Purge committees banned him from exhibiting and publishing in the press at the liberation for two years. Yeah. Uh, but this didn't stop him from self-publishing uh, this book, A la belle époque, um, but still to avoid any more trouble, he kept his drawings harmless and apolitical. Yes. So elegance uh, was an important marker of dignity for the French during the occupation and beyond. <laughs> However, because of severe cross restrictions throughout the 1940s, they had to show a lot of creativity to remain stylish. The artist Maurice Jules uses humor noir, the dark humor, in his drawing uh, entitled Big Requests. Leaving the cemetery after a burial, a man asks the crying widow for her deceased husband's shoe size. What was his shoe size? Hoping for a match so he can salvage them. The artist Maurice Jules was also investigated at the Liberation for collaboration. And the press court commission suspended him for 12 months from the 1st of September 1944. But because the publishing sector was less affected by the purge of collaborators at the liberation than the press sector, he managed to publish this book in 1946, despite a astonished reputation. Thank you. So let's have a look. So we've looked at some examples of cathartic mm -hmm. humor to cope with daily challenges. Now let's look at how humor was used to reject the other or the, the enemy. There are two types of enemy, the occupier and the internal enemy, the Vichy regime collaborators and profiteers. So we'll look at first um, the external uh, enemy. So at the liberation, the nation needed to reinvent and to reframe itself, as well as providing relief humor 
uh, belief, humor was used uh, to define and reinforce a sense of identity uh, for the French. And at this time, it is particularly important to distinguish who's in and who's out of the acceptable group. So we see many characters mocking or othering the enemy, which were the Germans, the profiteers, collaborators, we see. And when we see sometimes women. So mocking the occupied. So let's first look at drawings looking uh, at uh, the Germans. It's not working. Ah. That's good. <laughs> Uh, this comic book retraces the story of the occupation uh, in France, using animals to represent the main characters. It's a good example of animalization used for mockery and othering. The book was meant to be read by children and adults together and to invite a cross-generational discussion about the world. It showed uh, the world of humor as civic education. The images are engaging and fun, but the contents are grave and meaningful. It illustrates uh, well how humor can use discussions on difficult topics and push particular narratives when using the veil of laughter. This book was also uh, reprinted recently um, in 2017, I think, and you can find it in all bookshops in France. Uh, so it, it shows how memory has uh, perdured in this uh, area. Uh, so let's have a look at another book. So this is probably probably my favorite of the whole collection, Livre Noir uh, by Chancel, Jean-Louis Chancel. So this is one of the 30 plates of Jean-Louis Chancel's uh, lavishly printed portfolio, Livre Noir, uh, published in 1945 and contains fantastic examples of dark satire. This image uh, showcases the powerful combination of the clever drawing and a witty caption. So the landlord of the bar, with the cigarette there, is uh, Pierre Aval, head of the collaborationist uh, Vichy government during the occupation. He's listening intently to a conversation between two German soldiers. Behind him, on the wall, is a portrait of Marshal Pétain, his leader. The mini wine bottles in the foreground are all labeled with the names of the wine producing regions that the Germans gained control of during the war. These empty bottles, we see that corks have gone represent the regions of France that have been traded by Laval. The captured liquidation of France is a sarcastic pun. A liquidation can either mean administrative clearance or transformation or sorting into a liquid form, here wine, region by region, as the Germans take over their home country. So let's have a look at Lucky Farm, but and Leon Husson. So Leon, Leon Husson's lithographs collection was printed on luxurious linen paper, despite the shortages, and uh, sold in a slipcase, which suggested its intended purpose as a coffee table souvenir album. It's an interesting example of how memories from the war were produced and presented as objects of memory soon after the liberation. So here is a convoy of German soldiers uh, retreating uh, at the end of the war. An armed soldier with the leaves on his hat as camouflage looks scornfully back at the viewer. His armband uh, with a red cross is suggestive of a medical role, perhaps, but it contrasts with his facial expressions, uh, expression and weapons pointing to a less caring side. So the caption reads at this right, and as a hint, the recurrent conflicts between France and Germany will be back. The Troy and the rest of the convoy are loaded with books included, including a case of Burgundy wine. So humorous drawings often represent French resentment towards the pillaging of France by the Germans during the war and even after they retreated or as they retreated. Uh, this uh, uh, cartoon drawing uh, would not be funny without its title, which is a pun on reflux. So reflux are the movement of retreat of the defeated Germans, uh, or the heartburn one gets from eating too much rich French food. <laughs> the humor here is dark and bitter and clearly denounces the Germans. So we've seen examples of humorous drawings rejecting the occupier, but now we're going to see um, that they've also served to reject other enemies of the nation. 
So the internal one. So the announcing collaborators, the enemy was not only external Germans, but internal French. France had been deeply divided during the war between those who collaborated and those who resisted. The liberation was time for school settling. And the humor was also used for that. So let's have a look at Lyon dans les Chênes. So it's interesting to have this book because it's also from Lyon, it's not from Paris, quite a lot of the books were from the capital, but uh, humor was um, very um, spread out throughout the whole territory and uh, rejected the same people, whether it was from the southern zone or the northern zone. So in this illustration, Julien Pagin sharply criticizes the Germans' lavish lifestyle during the occupation, but not only the Germans, if you look closely. Several accommodated women and members of the French militia are happily mixing with the occupier. The militia can be recognized with their black beret and um, the Gaba symbol on, on the beret. The artist puts uh, both the militia and the women in the same category as the Nazis, as complicit traitors having a good time while others were struggling or even dying for their country. Many drawings in the collection showed an overwhelming uh, rejection of the Vichy government, seen as complicit with the Nazis. The main targets of the jokes were the head of state, Marshal Philippe Pétain, his head of government, uh, Laval, as we saw in the bar, and the head of information, Philippe Henriot, who was a um, yes, lecturer as that name. Uh, in this drawing by Jean Senat, a renowned uh, right-wing cartoonist active uh, before and after the war, Pétain draws graffiti in support of himself. <laughs> the artist does criticize Pétain's self-selling propaganda. That's quite a simple, simple drawing, but effective. Uh, let's have a look at Morivad. So this step, uh, some other drawings also served as criticism of the privileged or war profiteers who had survived because he could afford the inflated prices of the thriving black market or had prospered from collaborated with, collaborating with the Germans. Uh, the humorous drawings rejected these subgroups uh, from the new French identity. So we also have a lot of humor by prisoners of war. So Ihan talked a little bit about that uh, during her presentation. Uh, so far we've seen that the collection contains humor and daily difficulties are in different types of enemies. Another large subsection of the collection consists of drawings produced by French prisoners in the camps and forced labor. They use humor to ease the boredom of captivity and to help accept their challenging situation. So let's look at Jean Bellus first. So in his book, yeah, so Jean Belus cleverly reappropriates the title of Marseille, Marseille Carles film Les Visiteurs du Soir, um, The Night Visitors, which was released in 1942 during the occupation and was highly successful. The film's story is based on a 14th century French legend in which the devil, uh, disturbed by the encroaching forces of God, uh, sends his invoice to earth to drive the citizens to despair. Uh, but they prove unable to overcome the power of true love. Belus's night visitors are less romantic. At night, numerous rats and bedbugs visit prisoners whose only entertainment is a uh, hunting them. This is an illustration by Orbi in one of Morival's amusing poems in the northern French dialect, Sti. There was a poem with accompanying the drawing that I had to, to uh, translate. It was an interesting experience. <laughs> in this chaotic area, as in the poem in compliments, the prisoners, driven by hunger, fight bitterly over a pot, a pot of soup. Uh, all being exaggerated, their struggle for comical effect and to highlight how central hunger was for prisoners of war. In the background, an astonished German guard is uh, paralyzed uh, with shock, but remains passive. Yeah. The foreword of this book mentions that it was sold uh, in age of war prisoners. It was the case in many of many books and gala programs, which were published to fundraise for prisoners' rep repatriation and reintegration. Uh, so 
Aside from drawings from um, about the Trumps, prisoners and forced laborers also published cartoons about their return home, which was not always as they expected. The dis return of displaced persons, also known as the absence, was a central event in 1945. Uh, the French keenly awaited their loved ones, still in Germany. But despite this eagerness, uh, the repatriates often felt underwhelmed by the welcome they received when they returned. After waiting for years in Germany to return home, they were sometimes disappointed to discover that the country had somewhat learned to live without them. Repatriates received a welcome home package, which included money, rationing tickets, and a suit. The size of the package depended on their perceived heroism of suff also all suffering during the war. And the uh, prisoners of war and forced laborers were given a slightly smaller package than the resistance, the heroes, and the deportees, the martyrs. They had to wait so long for their suits that sometimes uh, they took to the streets in protest and even ransacked some suit factories near Bayern in the southwest. <clears throat> so let's look about the suit. Here we see a repatriate dressed in patched up clothes, talking to a plump, um, well-dressed man, supposedly someone who did well for himself during the war. They are commenting on two confident ladies walking past, wearing smart uniform, uh, resistant uniforms, one holding a hard to salt cigarette. So they, they did find some close quote then. Surely you would not have wanted to be given a woman's suit. Except that. Indeed. The rich hand prisoner is baffled that women resistance are better treated than himself. Insuriatingly for some veterans, women managed to get sought after clothes for uniforms in short supply for repatriate suits. The culture shock of women having new roles and more perceived power adds to the repatriate's feelings of social demotion. 1944 is also the year when French women uh, were given the right to vote. So they did that sense that uh, they're going up the social ladder in Japan. Mm -hmm. The man's embarrassment about his suit is mixed with resentment for women and for the glorious resistance. By contrast, women have a special place in uh, hero's drawings during captivity. So we're just going to see this now. So when they were in the camps, prisoners longed for women. They were a Francis thing. Mm -hmm. The title, Poule au pot, hen in a pot, is a pun referring to the traditional French country dish, chicken and vegetables in a broth, mm -hmm. with poule not referring to the tra traditional chicken, <laughs> but to the slang for young women, especially a promiscuous one, here making in a steaming pot. Mm -hmm. But the women um, they returned to did not match the idealized version dreamt about in captivity. In addition to being accused in some drawings of taking repatriate place in society, women were also suspected of infidelity. The return to conjugal life often proved difficult, and some prisoners did come home to find they'd been replaced or felt no longer needed. The drawings show that women were often seen by repatriates as threats to their reintegration. They had taken on new responsibilities, which men saw as theirs, and sometimes new husbands. The title of this drawing, The Eternal Return, suggests that betrayal is to be expected of women. It's only history repeating. We're far from the dream woman imagined in the camps. <laughs> So um, we have seen from humorous drawings published in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War that the French used humor to help them uh, survive the, the challenges of the present and digest a difficult uh, recent past. Humor made more palatable the difficulties of the early post-war period, but cartoonists also used it to redefine the new nation by including those um, who were morally acceptable, for instance, the Mizistan, and reject those perceived as unwanted members of the new France. Uh, the Nazis, the Vichy government, the collaborators, and sometimes even the women. I hope that uh, this very quick overview of my research gives you a glimpse of the rich uh, resource, the cartoons of 944, 946 students, and uh, are in uh, analyzing the complex and ambivalent emotions 
of this fascinating post-war transition. And how humor can serve as a tool to reflect or impact the various narratives at a given time. Many thanks for listening and give a forward to your question. Sure. So it's already six. I know some of you, you know, want to skip away, you know, feel free. But we are so happy to take questions. And just before we finish the official part, I want to say thank you to Charles, who is really at the origin of the collection, but is also, you know, on uh, continuing to support it, that its promotion and research uh, on it, as well as the Faculty for Medieval and Modern Languages and Linguistics, who is helping with uh, the organization of, of the event and was also organizing other festivals in that city to have a 